Well, all over this world today, Christians and their curious friends are getting together just like this for some reflection on and worship of the risen Christ. We call this Resurrection Sunday. Really, every Sunday for the Christian is a Resurrection Sunday. Every one of them is a celebration of Jesus' resurrection. That's why the early Christians began meeting together on Sunday mornings. You probably know that before, that before Christ, before his resurrection, the Jewish people met on Saturday for this kind of thing. Well, that all changed with the resurrection of Jesus, which happened on that glorious Sunday morning. And we need to appreciate how important it is, how significant it is that the day of worship changed and changed so quickly and with such great significance. N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar, he explains the significance of the change of day in the worship of the life of the church. He says, there's very early evidence of the Christians meeting on the first day of the week, Sunday. This is hardly to be explained simply on the grounds that they wanted to distinguish themselves from their Jewish neighbors. The seventh day Sabbath, Saturday, was so firmly rooted in Judaism as a major social, cultural, religious, and political landmark that to make any adjustment in it was not like a modern Western person deciding to play tennis on Tuesdays instead of Wednesdays. It takes a conscious, deliberate, and sustained effort to change or adapt one of the most powerful elements of symbolic practice in a worldview. By far the easiest explanation for this is that all the early Christians believed that something had happened on that first Sunday morning. That's why we're here this morning. That's why we meet together every week. Well, as we meet together as a church every week, we've been studying the book of Acts together. We've been seeing throughout, especially in recent weeks, that Christianity is, on the one hand, the realization of stuff really old. It's the fulfillment of promises given long ago. On the other hand, it is the dawn of something new and expected. On the one hand, Jewish people long before Jesus believed that at the end of time, there would be a final universal resurrection of the dead. On the other hand, no one at the time of Jesus believed that there would be any hint of that before the end of time. And then one guy comes along, and he is resurrected. He defeats death. No one was looking for that. No one was talking about that. That's why when the gospel accounts record Jesus predicting his crucifixion and being raised on the third day, his closest followers couldn't even comprehend what he was talking about. Crucifixion, they may have understood that, but resurrection, being raised on the third day, that would be like me saying to you, tomorrow I'm going to jump to the moon. You would think, well, that must be a metaphor for something, but I'm not sure what it is. It was that categorically otherworldly for those first Christians. That is, until they saw him, until they heard him, and that changed everything. The living, resurrected Jesus appeared to many different people after his resurrection, hundreds of people. At one time, 500 people. So this wasn't a vision, this wasn't a hallucination. One of those to whom Jesus appeared was a guy named Saul also known as Paul. At first, and for several years, this Saul, this Paul, was totally against the Christians. He was leading the campaign to lock them up and or have them killed in the way that Osama bin Laden was so opposed to the U.S., so Saul was to Christians in the way that the Nazis were so against the Jews. So this Paul was against the Christians. But then the risen Christ appeared and it changed everything. 
Here's how he tells the story in Acts 26. Would you turn there in your Bibles if you haven't yet already? If you have a Bible with you, turn with me to Acts 26. This is now two decades after it happened. Here he's on trial for his faith, now faith in Christ. He's before a Roman governor and a Jewish king. And here's what he says, starting in verse 9. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities." In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with all the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things which you have seen. We can stop there. Let's consider Paul's shocking conversion. That's the first of four headings that we'll consider this morning as we try to work our way through the rest of the passage. First, consider Paul's shocking conversion in these verses that we read. Now, we've been talking as a church in recent days about Paul's shocking conversion. So I hesitate to belabor the point, but many of you haven't been with us in recent weeks, and you're not even sure who this guy is or what happened or why it matters and why we would talk about it. For your sake, let me just review some things and highlight some things from what we read. Paul's conversion was shocking. It was not expected. It it wasn't explainable apart from the resurrection. Imagine in 2003 if Osama bin Laden turned himself in to the U.S., said he was sorry, paid for his crimes, sought U.S. citizenship, and, and became our biggest patriot. It's absurd. Imagine in the 1940s if Hitler admitted he was wrong and sought to convert to Judaism. That's unthinkable. Even the most secular of historians, the least Christian of historians, they all agree that there was a guy named Paul, that he was at one time the foremost persecutor of Christians, but then he became the foremost preacher of Christ And he remained that way for the next 34 years until his death, which, by the way, was a death for Christ. It wasn't a private experience. Others were with him. This isn't something that Paul was looking for. He wasn't looking for a resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. That would have been the last thing he'd want. But nevertheless, when he saw and or was blinded by this Savior living and in front of him. He was instantly and forever changed. The dominoes fell one after another. The implications are massive and many. If this is true, then Jesus' followers had been right and they worship him rightly. Then everything Jesus said and taught is true. Everything he said about himself is true and trustworthy. Paul had a personal meeting with Jesus But his message wasn't his own. It wasn't his own making. This story isn't like the birth of so many religions born out of one man's private experience with some angel in upstate New York. No, this is the faith. Jesus revealed himself to his first disciples. And now here's another named Paul. In verse 8 of chapter 26, earlier in Paul's speech, he asked the question, why would anyone think it incredible that God raises the dead? 
In light of Paul's conversion, why would you think it's incredible that God would raise the dead? Paul would say, he did. I saw him. Secondly, consider the Great Commission. We've already seen a bit of Paul's commission in verse 16. Let's read on from there. Verse 16 says, I have appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Now, Paul had a unique commission, and hence he was given a unique encounter with the bodily risen Christ. But conversion and commission are words that are also aptly applied to every Christian. Every Christian. We, we call it the Great Commission when we're talking in terms of the, the mission that, he's, that Jesus has given to every Christian. It's put at the end of every gospel account. Go into the world and make disciples. Go and tell. Go and witness. Go and, and make more followers of Jesus. This happens one at a time. When it happens in someone's life, we call that conversion. What that Christian then is called to do, you could say, is part of this great commission. In verse 18, though it's applied specifically to Paul, really does extend to every Christian and what we hope will happen to more and more people. Look at verse 18. I'm sending you to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is conversion. This is what happened to the apostle Paul. This is what happens to every Christian when they become a Christian. No one's born a Christian. Being a Christian doesn't simply mean checking a box on a survey form that you're that more than something else. It, it's an experience. It's a reality. It's going from not seeing to seeing. It's, it's turning, turning to Christ, but also turning from whatever form of salvation and worship you were pursuing before. To turn to Christ means to turn from something. It means to be transferred from darkness to light or from Satan to God. It means receiving forgiveness simply by believing that Jesus can do it. Paul was forgiven. The worst of sinners, the one who most famously killed early Christians trying to snuff out the whole movement. He was forgiven. You can be forgiven and have a place among those who are being purified. I love that word place here. It means home. It means position. It means lot. It might mean identity. We have a people to identify with when we become a Christian. Not just forgiveness, which is simply between us and God and gets us into heaven. But no, we're given a place, an identity, a position. All this now because of the Great Commission, because it spread from Jesus to his disciples, through the Apostle Paul, all through the early Roman world. And here we are today, proof of it spreading in this world. G.K. Chesterton wrote, if I find a key on the road and discover it fit an opened particular lock, I'd almost assume, I'd assume, rather not almost, I'd assume most likely that the key was made by the lockmaker. If I find a set of teaching 
set out in pre-modern oriental society that has proven itself of such universal validity that it has fascinated or satisfied millions of people in every culture, including the best minds and yet the simplest hearts, that it has made itself home in virtually every culture, inspired masterpieces in every field of art, and continues to grow and spread rapidly. Are they likely to be the works of a deceiver or a fool? In fact, it is more likely that they were designed by the heart maker. I think that's true. If you're not a Christian, don't be offended by the Great Commission. Don't be offended by Paul's desire to convert the people who were hearing him that day, as we'll see as we read later on. Don't be offended. Our master commands us to do this. And if it's true, it is the most loving thing to tell you and to plead with you about. Thirdly, consider the scriptural connections. The scriptural connections. This is a point that Paul makes in verse 22 and 23. He says, to this day, I've had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. What Paul's getting at is that the Old Testament, hundreds of years, even millennia before Christ, foretold what was happening in the days of Christ. And quite specifically, light to the nations through Christ's suffering and resurrection, his death and resurrection. The Old Testament foreshadowed that and foretold of it. If you were with us at our Good Friday service, we looked at Isaiah 53, a chapter I'd encourage you to read if you've never read it. 700 years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah was talking about, in great detail by the way, the gruesome death that the Christ would suffer on account of sin and sinners. In fact, for those sinners. And that it would end in victory and resurrection and glory. And the reward would be that of his people. The prophets talked about this a number of different ways. The whole Old Testament, you could say, was pointing in this direction. Listen to Luke 24 here where Jesus is giving some of his parting words to his disciples. As he meets with two guys on, the, on a road it says, verse 27, he was beginning with Moses and all the prophets, interpreting to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Or later, he says to another group of disciples, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written in the Old Testament that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. If the historical evidence for Christ, if the logical deductions about Christ, and if the unlikeliness of the alternatives that he truly died and truly was raised don't do it for you, well, look to the scriptures. Read the Bible. You don't need to start at the beginning with Genesis. You can start in the New Testament, which is constantly looking back to the Old Testament, showing how it was pointing ahead to Christ and fulfilled in him. Consider scriptural connections. Fourthly, consider the typical conclusions. The typical conclusions that people make about Jesus. There are three conclusions or responses to Jesus in the last half dozen verses of our chapter. The first is with the Roman governor Festus. Verse 24, as Paul was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Festus scorned. He scorned. 
he simply interrupted Paul and he protested with a cheap put down. Remember, this is a judicial hearing, but this isn't a typical judicial procedure to say, Paul, you are out of your mind. You are crazy. Your books and your big degrees have got you all wound up and now you're seeing stuff. He's dismissing Paul, ridiculing, scorning, and ready to move on. Don't be like Festus. Notice Paul's response, verse 25. I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true in rational words. And then Paul turns his attention back to King Agrippa. Verse 26, for the king knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. What things? What hasn't been done in a corner? What does the king know about? Well, the whole Jesus thing, really. I mean, you think of Agrippa's family. His great-grandfather was Herod the Great, He was the one who slaughtered all the male children two years and younger because he had heard the rumor of a newborn king of the Jews. You think of Herod Herod Agrippa's grandfather, who was the Herod who had John the Baptist beheaded. You think of King Agrippa's father, who had James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, executed. This is the family line. They've heard about these things. Not to mention the miracles of Jesus. You think of the miracles and how many people either experienced them or saw them or heard about them. Remember that one time Jesus fed 3,000 people miraculously. Remember another time he fed 5,000 people miraculously. People were talking about these things. When you read the gospel accounts, you feel the hype growing and growing around Jesus. Yes, the controversy growing as well, but there's hype. There's fame and controversy. There was that controversial trial, which was held in public. There was that execution upon the cross. And then there was the empty tomb in the missing body. That unsolved mystery still looms 25 years later. No one has produced the body. No one can really explain the empty tomb except the followers of Jesus who say, we've seen him. He's alive. Surely Agrippa has heard all this. Surely he's even heard of the growth of the whole Christian movement. He knows its controversies and its successes. He knows this stuff because it really happened. It's history. It wasn't done in a corner. Then Paul moves from current events back to the Bible, verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. This is fascinating. This is so bold and courageous of Paul. Paul, the defendant, turns the tables and asks a direct question of the king. And the judge, and if Agrippa says yes to Paul's question, yes, I believe the prophets, well, then Paul can begin to work from the prophets and how they foretold of Jesus. If King Agrippa says, no, I don't believe any prophets, well, he's a bad Jew. That's not a good thing. So he's trapped. How will he respond? Verse 28, Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Agrippa stalled. Verse 28 is saying that. It's a stall tactic. He's dodging Paul's question about the prophets. He's done with this discussion. He's not playing chess with Paul. Now, I don't think he's saying, you've almost persuaded me. I'm almost there. Give me just a little more time, and I might be convinced of Christianity. No, I think he's protesting and he's scoffing. Are you trying to get me to become a Christian right here, right now, in this hearing? 
with that little speech? Are you trying to get me to become a Christian? What will Paul say? Verse 29, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Which leads to the the third possible conclusion or response to Christ. Paul submitted. Don't forget that's a major part of this story. That's what Paul is telling us. That's what he's telling his hearers. Back 25 years ago, Paul submitted when he was presented with the risen Christ. He fell to the ground. He called Jesus Lord. He obeyed. He went forth and followed him. His eyes were opened. He was blinded temporarily at first, but metaphorically, his eyes were opened. He thought Christ was bad, and now he sees this Jesus is good, merciful even, forgiving all these sins, these sins. What grave sins. The Christian killer is forgiven by the Christ of all his sins. He's transferred from a kingdom of darkness to a kingdom of light. He receives a place among God's people. Surely he lost a place coming to Christ. Surely he lost some family. Surely he lost some friends. Surely he lost his Pharisee job. But now he has Christ, and he has Christ's people. He has a place. All this, I think, begins to explain for us Paul's remarkable boldness, his confidence, his gentleness here, his compassion. I mean, what a guy. Oh, for more Pauls. Oh, to be more like Paul in this regard. Here he was imprisoned for two years, now on trial before a king and a governor, thousands of dignitaries and famous people there to watch the regalia, and he doesn't defend himself. He's interested in defending Christ. He doesn't so much look to get himself out of this pickle as he much more wants to get his hearers out of the greatest pickle of sin and Satan and self into Christ. They deride him, you're crazy, Paul. He simply responds with politeness and honesty. He asks the king a humble but direct question. What great confidence, what great boldness, what great humility, what what kindness. This is a man who used to be a firebrand, glad to lock up moms and dads and see some of them killed. And now he's this man standing before these fancy people and humbly telling them they need Jesus. Christian, I hope you see this example of Paul and you take it to heart. I pray that it strengthens you. I pray that it enheartens you. I pray that you want to, after this, Go tell someone about Jesus. Do something like this. Not get arrested. But just to just lovingly tell someone what is most important in this world and what they need to know. Even to reason with them. Even be rational in your conversation. Tell them. You should consider Paul's shocking conversion. You should consider the great commission and the spread of the gospel throughout all the world. Or maybe tell them, consider the scriptural connections, how these things were promised and then fulfilled, and God is still at work today. Consider the typical conclusions that people make. Don't scorn like Festus. Don't stall like Agrippa. Isn't it time to submit like Paul. You know, that can happen here today. 
I don't suspect that the Lord Jesus is going to appear bodily before you or speak audibly to you. But every Christian at one point encountered Christ, either through the hearing of words taught and spoken like this, or reading the pages of Scripture. You encounter Christ. You, you get him aright, and you apprehend him, and you see him not as foolish, not as wrong, but as true and glorious. And you turn. You turn to him. You embrace him. With faith, you simply ask for his mercy and forgiveness and believe that he'll give it because he died and was raised. You find a place, a place among God's people, a place with God himself. This is conversion. This is Paul's story. This is the story of many people in this room. I pray it becomes your story, whether soon or later. Christian, think through with me. If the resurrection is true, what follows? What follows? Well, the Bible gives us all kinds of answers to this. It ties so much to the resurrection. I mean, if the resurrection is true, then Jesus' offer of forgiveness is there and valid and available. What he did on that cross in paying for sins was stamped approved by God in the resurrection. The promises of victory and the defeat of death have been fulfilled. God is bringing these things to pass. He will, in the end, defeat death. So now death is, it's this, it's this passage to his presence for the Christian. That's why death doesn't have sting that's why death isn't victorious. We think through what follows because of the resurrection. We would come to Christ being exalted. Christ reigning over all creation. Christ coming again. Christ one day transforming this world into a whole new world, a new heaven and new earth as they meet. If Christ is risen, then the enemy has been defeated. There will be justice in the end. If Christ is risen, then these frail bodies one day will be transformed and they won't suffer under the weight of sin any longer. If Christ is risen, he will bring us to glory. If Christ is risen, then right now he is interceding on our behalf and we can come to him with our smallest of needs and he'll actually show sympathy, let alone provide help or fix our problems. Not all of them. Here's Paul in the middle of imprisonment and trial and eventually on his way to death. But I think here he is this day, smiling, smiling about his Lord smiling about his past and his future. And I think he's probably in his mind rehearsing words he wrote once to the Roman church where he said, who can separate us from the love of God? No, nothing. Not famine, not sickness, not, not threats, not sword, nothing. Separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I pray you know that today. Let's pray. Lord, indeed, your resurrection and love for us have massive implications. Nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing can separate us from your purposes. Lord, may we boldly proclaim this to a dark and dying world. We pray for those who are with us this morning who haven't yet come to encounter the living Christ. Perhaps today they would. Perhaps today they would stop scorning, stop stalling, and submit. And happily so. May we as Christians, Lord, represent you well in this world. Give us boldness. Give us joy. Help us to speak well of you and to speak often. Because you are our rock and our redeemer. We give thanks to you afresh today. 
In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.